Do you ever stop for a second and think what technology the US and her allies had before World War II? Do you ever consider what advancements the Germans made during this time period, apparently using ancient texts that have seemingly never been recovered? If Germany developed these things from texts that have since been hidden away or destroyed, then all the technology that we have today are based on the advancements the Germans made. You're talking stealth technology, guided missiles, lasers, and even fiber optic communications. But to name a few, what all this is, is an inventory of what the Nazis had in their arsenal after World War II had concluded. They developed technology that was previously beyond comprehension in just a few years, and we are still using and adapting this today. Wait till you hear this. It is incredible to note that the German advancements made during World War II were nothing short of highly advanced even by today's standards. In fact, it was nothing short of a miracle that we won the Second World War when you begin to understand that the Germans really should have been invincible with these things. Makes you wonder about some sort of intervention in the name of humanity prevailing over an evil agenda. The area these advancements were made is now Poland and Adolf defended this area to the last possible moment of World War II. The Russians took Berlin and the Allies were diverted to this part of what was then Germany to take the technology from under the noses of the Russians. You are talking about the acquirement of super weapons. The technology factories that were seized were jam packed full of stuff in development. This is where the greatest minds of our planet were forced to make advancements using the ancient text. This knowledge was sliced down the middle of the end of World War II and that led to a technological war between the US and her allies and Russia, the likes of which the world had never seen before. Is it possible that even between two of the world's most powerful political rivals, there is a secret understanding, one based on American and Russians past and future roles in outer space? Does this extend to numerous experiences involving extraterrestrial contact? As evidence, they point to an occasion that took place just a few months after Dmitry Medvedev's now famous exchange with Barack Obama. President совершенно секрет и она целиком и полностью посвящена пришельцам которые посетили нашу планету одновременно предоставляется доклад абсолютно закрытый on december 7 2012 after giving a prime time network interview in moscow medvedev made remarks off stage which seemed to openly acknowledge the existence of extraterrestrials and the russian government's efforts to keep that existence a secret Although most of the journalists in the room believed the Russian president's remarks to have been made in jest, there were others who were not so certain. This is one of the most dramatic statements that emanates out of Russia, and so it's fascinating. Dmitry Medvedev said, when you become president of Russia, you're given information on aliens in our country and the human groups that are monitoring them. He was totally with a straight face during all of this. Here he is on film saying that there is a secret governmental cooperation occurring in the background that has the highest levels of classification to really monitor extraterrestrials that are visiting our planet. Forget all the differences, forget ideologies. At the highest level, the two nations work together. After World War II, there was a number of UFO encounters, very important encounters, and this gave impetus to joint cooperation between the nations. Even during the tension-filled decades of the Cold War, experts believe that not only did such a secret relationship exist, but that it began several decades ago as a consequence of what they believe to be the Soviet Union's first documented UFO encounter, an event they commonly refer to as the Russian Roswell. In June of 1948, at a remote Soviet military installation known as Kapustin Yar, an unidentified flying object is detected over the base. Strange blips were seen on radar. Something was tracked performing extraordinary speeds and maneuvers, and a Russian fighter jet was scrambled to intercept it. 
The pilot saw a silver cigar shaped object and was told, shoot this thing down, it's in restricted military airspace. The UFO fired some sort of direct energy weapon, a death ray, but before the Russian jet was downed, it managed to launch a missile and shot down the UFO. Some people have speculated this was the time that the Russians found out about extraterrestrials. According to the myths and legends, at Kaputskin Yar, they actually recovered bodies. They recovered the spacecraft itself, and it was kept there for study and reverse engineering. We are told that there is an underground facility under Kaputskin Yar, similar probably to facilities here in the States, where a full examination could be performed on the pilots of these craft. To researchers, what makes this story all the more significant is that it occurred within a year of the now infamous Roswell incident, in which a UFO reportedly crashed in the New Mexico desert sometime in June of 1947. This took place near the only active military unit in the world that had nuclear weapons. It was known as the Roswell 509th Bombing Unit, and they were armed to the teeth with nukes. Similarly, over the Soviet Union, at places like Kaputskin Yar, we've got significant UFO activity being reported, military engagements just like in the United States. And many believe that extraterrestrials had a strong interest in the nuclear technologies that were then developing on planet Earth, which is exactly why they were there. Could it be that both the Kaputskin Yar and Roswell incidents were attempts by extraterrestrials to make contact because of mankind's recent development of nuclear weapons. But if such contact did occur, did it signal an era of secret cooperation between the world's two great superpowers, or did it only trigger a greater degree of rivalry and competition? In Roswell, you had the crash. You had to recover alien bodies, but the aliens were dead. There was no way to communicate with them because they had been killed. So we had the technology, but probably no really good idea on how to start reverse engineering it. Whereas at Kapuskin Yar, as the story goes, they not only got the spacecraft itself, but apparently there was at least one survivor of the incident. So what could the Russians possibly have learned from that alien extraterrestrial biological entity that they were not able to learn from our Roswell incident? Why were the Russians first into space? Why did they manage to do Sputnik 1 and then send Yuri Gagarin up into orbit and leave the Americans standing? Because on paper, you'd think that the US government should have won that race, but they didn't. If the Russians got live aliens, maybe they found out something from what happened at Kaputskin Yar that gave them the edge in the space race. Is it possible that the Soviet Union gained a strategic advantage in the so-called space race because of help it received from an extraterrestrial visitor? But if so, then how did the United States so quickly catch up and some would argue overtake them by being the first to put humans on the moon? Perhaps the answers are easily obtained, not by examining what the two nations were each admitting to in public, but what they were doing together in secret. What do you guys think about this anyway? Comments below, and as always, thank you for watching. Putting the propellants into the engine, now you're seeing that liquid oxygen and kerosene mixing and billowing up in the initial stage of starting up those engines. Now, when it reached full thrust and started to get thrust from those five engines, seven and a half million pounds, you see how it sucks all the material back down underneath the vehicle. And that was because now all of that material is going at a tremendous speed and being pushed out into the flame trench and it just sucks all of that all, all of that material back down. On, on the right you see two tail service masts, there's a third one on the other side of the vehicle and around the vehicle you also see four hold down arms. Now the vehicle sat on those hold down arms and there was a mechanism inside there that held it onto the launch pad until liftoff. At T minus zero those relieve, would release after they got the proper signal from the engines that all five engines were running properly. It would release and as soon as it released those tail service arms would move and all the mechanisms would go up into a hood underneath those hoods so that they would be protected from the uh, 
from the exhaust of the engines. You see ice coming down now off the vehicle. You know that the space shuttle is real concerned about um, debris coming off the external tank, which is insulated. And the reason for that is the thermal protection system on the space shuttle, which sits on the side, is, is very delicate and can't be hit by that much. But the Saturn V had no such problem. So the Saturn V's liquid oxygen tank on the first stage wasn't insulated, so you get a lot of ice coming off of it when it hits the vibration. Now you see liftoff has happened, the tail service masts are pulling back up into the hoods, the uh, F1 engines are coming up, and you see that dark band of gas that's coming out of those engines all around, and then you'll see it get to the really bright part. Now that cool gas, it's cooler gas is the reason it's dark, that's coming from the turbine exhaust, and the turbine exhaust is put around, is dumped into the engine around the inside of that nozzle so it would be cooler and would act as something of an insulator on that nozzle extension so it wouldn't get too hot. That central gas is what's coming out of the engine uh, injector where the liquid oxygen and the uh, kerosene is being mixed um, uh, together coming out of that injector. Now on the tail service mast and on the hold down arms, in fact even over here on the left hand side in the corner of the tower, you see a white material, whitish material that, that it's painted. That is actually a, a, a material that was designed to burn and char. And trying to protect this material so that the, the, the launch installation so that it would get a minimum of damage from a Saturn V launch, they painted these, these uh, particular tail service masts and hold down arm covers and the corners of this tower with this ablative uh, kind of paint. And this material was designed to burn and char so that it would burn and the underlying material would be insulated and stay safe. You'll see that happening in just a moment. Now you're seeing that the water deluge system has definitely been activated and you're seeing a lot of that flash into steam and come up against the quartz mirror that the, uh, the camera is, is uh, housed in. Now, Remember I was talking about that white material, it's a flame now as it's getting hit by the uh, engine exhaust um, and it was designed to do that. You'll see it's already starting to char. You see the third uh, tail service mast over on the other side, there were three total, and you see at least three of the four hold down arms. Uh, you see the hoods now on the hold down arms have closed over, so they're protecting that mechanism that held the vehicle down. And you see that all of that material that's in the exhaust is now a fire on its own. Now look how instantaneously all of the water that's dumped into this area, and there was a lot of water dumped into this area, is instantly flashing to steam. It's very, very hot there right now. And as that tower over here on the left, you see it's starting to burn as well. So you're starting to get uh, enormous heat coming off of it. In fact, it, it, there are some cameras where you'll get a view of these launches and the grass around the pad Typically, you would have a number of grass fires right around the pad because the heat would move all the way off the pad to a, to a high enough degree to light uh, a good deal of the grass around the launch pad. There are usually several grass fires that you see after on some of these cameras. Now you see that white material really uh, burning now, including over here on the tower. You see the water deluge system is full on. Um, at this point, the, the uh, vehicle would have cleared the tower, but the exhaust from those five F1 engines was long enough to still be impinging on the la launch pad, and even at this point. Um, all of the white uh, area you see, which is a flame, uh, is that char material. Uh, there's an enormous amount of water being poured down into the flame trench and in, down through the hole, as well as you see some nozzles here on the base of the mobile launcher that are dumping water right onto the mobile launcher. And at this point, there's also water coming from above in order to shield that tower. So there's an awful lot of water coming down on, onto the pad now. Now you'll start to see a lot of this water and debris as the vehicle has moved away, start to swirl around, some of it getting on the quartz window of the camera. Uh, you're seeing the, the burning of the uh, uh, insulation materials start to, to to go away, and you're also seeing a good deal of um, of the steam coming off that's not being blown away the way it was by the exhaust, and you're getting a better idea of just how much water is being dumped onto this, and still it's so hot that it's flashing a good bit of it into steam. Now pretty much all of the char is done. Uh, there's no longer impingement going on from the vehicle. The vehicle has moved up away from the tower and has started its trajectory out over the ocean. You still see a good bit of debris 
uh, occurring. Now this, this launch happened at 9.32 in the morning, so it's really pretty bright here, but the camera exposure was set so as to, to be able to see as much detail as it could while the engines were, were being started and moving up. So it starts to get a little bit darker after the engines are out. And you're starting to see a lot more of the water coming down on top of the window in the housing. So this was the launch of Apollo 11, the first manned lunar landing from the corner of the uh, tower on the mobile launch platform.